To really understand EDCS, I decide to spend a couple minutes on understanding what a PKA means, a public key infrastructure. I'm going to start from an example where a user wants to connect to a website using his web browser. If we are not using HTTPS that is based on SSL TLS, then anyone between me and the server can intercept and read data in clear text. So in this case, SSL TLS are used for data protection, right? But how? Quickly, what is the difference between SSL and TLS? Well, TLS is just a maintained version of SSL. Because in 1995, SSL was introduced by the Netscape company. And then in 1999, another corporate called EETF took that SSL protocol and maintained it and renamed it to TLS. So basically, TLS is a more secure and maintained version of SSL. So how TLS protects data? First of all, TLS is not meant to prevent the capture or the interception of data. Instead, it wants to protect it. So even if you capture it, there is nothing you can do with it. Let's illustrate a client and the server. The clients want to send data to the server. Without encryption, anyone in the same network that this data passed through can intercept it in clear text, read it, and tamper with it. To prevent that, we need encryption to provide confidentiality which ensures that the data is only accessible by the client and the server. But what if a man in the middle intercepts the encrypted data? Although they can't read it because it's encrypted, they could still modify it. At this point, we need integrity, which ensures that the data has not been modified between the client and the server. We achieve this using hashing algorithms like MD5, SHA family, and other hashing algorithms. But again, how can we prove that the client or the server is really who they claim to be. This is where public key infrastructure, PKA, comes into play. Now we have three concepts that need to be present to confirm that data sent across the wire is secure and protected. We have confidentiality, means data is only accessible by the client and the server, and we use encryption algorithms for that. We have integrity, means data is not modified between the client and the server, and we use hashing algorithms for that. We have authentication that proves that the client and most important, the server, are indeed who they say they are, and we use a PKA for that. Great, we have kind of a general idea of how TLS makes sure that the data sent across the wire is protected. But what actually happens? How the encryption confirms confidentiality, and how hashing confirms integrity, and how a PKA confirms authentication. Now, let's get into how hashing verifies the integrity of data. I am sure that you have heard of MD5, SHA-1, and the SHA family. So let's say we have a client that want to send data to the server. Now, if someone is in the middle, he can intercept that data and tamper with it. We use hashing to confirm that the client is the entity who sent the data. But how? Well, the client will hash the message, for example, using MD5 algorithm, as we do in Linux, we're gonna hash the message in low and then send the hash value of the message and the clear text message to the server. The server will take the message, calculate the hash value. If it's the same as the one sent by the client, then the data was not modified and indeed the client is who claims to be. But what if a man in the middle captures the data, change it and then calculate the new MD5 hash of the new message and change it also? Then the server will take the message calculate the hash, it is indeed the same as the one in the package, which means the message is from the client. But that's not true. To fix this problem, the server and the clients, before even exchanging messages, they need to establish a key. So this key will be known only by the client and the server. We're going to talk about how this key is going to be established later on in this course. And then when the client sends the message, the hash calculation will be the key plus the message. Then the client sends the message and the hash value without the key. And then when the server receives the message and the hash, he will take the key, add to it the message, and then calculate the hash value and compare it with the hash value sent in the client request. So even if a user intercepts the client request, he can't create the correct hash value because he don't know the key. This technique that we just discussed is called MAC, Message Authentication Code, because it validates the integrity which means that no user in the middle was able to tamper the message since he didn't have the key. And also, it ensures authentication because the only clients that can send a valid message and a hash is the client who holds the key. So with this method, 
we ensure data integrity and the authentication of the client and the server. Now, as we said before, the client and the server needs to agree on the key, but they also need to agree on how the key should be combined with the message. Because if the clients calculate the hash of key plus message and the server calculate the hash of message plus key, there is no way those two values gonna match, even that it's the same key. So the client and the server must agree on a key and also the combination of the key and the message. So the industry standard implementation of Mac, which means how the key and the message should be combined, is called HMAC, hash-based authentication code. And that's how SSL TLS provides data integrity. Now, let's explain how encryption is used in TLS to provide confidentiality. As we said before, encryption is used to provide confidentiality. But how? Well, I am sure you know that there are two types of encryption, asymmetric and symmetric. The asymmetric encryption uses two keys. If one is used for encrypting the data, the other is used for decrypting it, like the RSI algorithm. So let's say we have two users, E and B. User E want to send a message to user B while nobody in the middle sees or tamper the message. With asymmetric encryption, user E will generate two keys. One is used for encrypting the data and we call it the public key and the other key is used to decrypt the data. That's called the private key. But you need to know that if I encrypt the data with the private key, I can decrypt it with the public key. So with whatever key I used for encryption, the other key will be used for decrypting the data. So both user E and B generate their own public and private key. User E will use user B public key to encrypt the message. So when the user B receive it, he will decrypt it using his own private key. And this is how asymmetric encryption is used to provide confidentiality. But we can't use asymmetric encryption for data protection since it has some weaknesses. First, it's slower because it requires much large key sizes. Also, in asymmetric encryption, we have the ciphertext expansion. So whatever you encrypt with asymmetric encryption, it ends up larger and larger. And that's why we also have symmetric encryption, where there is only one key you use it to encrypt and decrypt data. So if user E wants to send a message to user B using symmetric encryption, first of all, they need to establish an encryption key. And then user E will encrypt this data with that key and user B will decrypt it with the same key. That's faster than the asymmetric encryption, but also it's less secure because that key is being shared on the wire. And if someone capture it, he can encrypt, decrypt all the data. To fix this problem, we have what it's called hybrid encryption, which means we use both encryption methods. We use the asymmetric encryption to establish the symmetric key between E and B, then we use symmetric encryption to exchange the data. So now, even that we have choose symmetric encryption to encrypt the data, but the key can't be intercepted by an entity in the middle since asymmetric key was used to exchange it. And that's how the SSL TLS protocol provide confidentiality. It uses both encryption types for data Data protection. As we mentioned it before at the beginning, there are three checks for SSL TLS. Confidentiality, which is provided by encryption, integrity, which is verified using hashing algorithms, and authentication, which is provided by the PKA, the public key infrastructure. But we still don't understand what a PKA is. Let's say we have a website called bank.com and the client is a web browser. The client wants to send data to the web server securely. So they use symmetric encryption for confidentiality and HMAC for integrity. Both of this requires a mutual secret key between the client and the server. Before we can apply symmetric encryption and MAX, we must establish a symmetric key. We have learned that asymmetric encryption will be used for secure key exchange. So the server generate a set of asymmetric keys a public and a private key, and the client also generate its own asymmetric keys to exchange the symmetric key. Great. But there is one more thing we need. Authentication. Any server like the one in our example, bank.com, can generate asymmetric keys using various tools that we will explore in this course. But how does a client, like a web browser, know that the server is who claims to be? How can the client trust that it's not communicating with an imposter? If the web server claims to be bank.com, 
how can we confirm that as a client? This is where the CA, Certificate Authority, comes into play. A CA is a trusted entity that issues digital certificates. The client trusts the CA because the CA public key is stored in the client web browser. There are many CAs like DigiCert, GoDaddy, GlobalSide, and others. The CA generate its own public and private key. And when the server, bank.com, wants to prove its identity to the client, it sends a certificate signing request, a CSR, to the CA containing the server public key and information about its identity. The CA then signs the server public key with its private key and issues a digital certificate to the server, in our case, bank.com. Now, when the client receives the bank.com certificate, the client browser can verify that it was signed by a trusted CA using the CA public key, which is, as we said before, stored in the browser. So. If the certificate is valid and matches the domain bank.com, the client can trust that the server is indeed bank.com because the client trusts the CA and the CA votes for bank.com. Notice that all three components, the client, server, and CA are crucial for making this work. These three key players form a triangle known as the PKA or public key infrastructure. Anytime you have a client, server, and a CA working together, you have a PKA, and that's how PKA provide authentication. Again, three entities form the PKA, the client, server, and CA. Clients need to connect securely or verify an identity, server needs to prove its identity, and the CA validate identities and generate certificate. Most of us are familiar with the PKA for web. In this scenario, the client is the web browser, the server may be a website like bank.com and the CA could be an entity like GoDaddy, SickTigo, DigiCert or Eden Trust. However, PKA is not limited just to web security. There is also a PKA for email signing, code signing and so on. For example, when you try to install a software in Windows, if it's not signed with a trusted certificate, you will see a warning like the one in the screenshot. On the left, Windows is showing you that the software is signed by Mozilla Corporation, which means it was signed with a certificate issued by a CA that Mozilla uses. Here, your computer is the client's need to verify the software identity before allowing it to run. The software is acting as the server in this analogy, wants to prove its identity, and the CA that issues the certificate used for signing ensures this identity is valid. If the software is not signed, then you're gonna get a warning like the image in the right. As you can see, in an internal corporate environment, companies may need their own PKA for internal purposes like code signing, email signing, or securing local web applications. This is where an organization can implement and set up its own CA to sign and create certificates for its internal resource. This brings us to EDCS. Active Directory Certificate Services. So EDCS is a Microsoft implementation of a PKA, integrating with Active Directory Forest to prevent a range of services from encrypting file system to digital signatures and user authentication. 